All right, so chapter seven is all about acids and bases. So let's really quickly try to classify them in two columns. And oftentimes you can tell the difference between an acid and a base based on taste. If you taste something that's acidic, what does it generally taste like? So think about like citrus fruits, right? Citrus fruit, fruit, fruits are pretty acidic. They tend to be kind of sour, right? So acids can tend to be sour if you taste them. Bases, on the other hand, um, would be something like, has anybody had tonic water before? Tonic water is pretty bitter. Um, it, it has more basic properties in it. So bases tend to be bitter rather than sour. And then in lab, you also tested acids and bases using a uh, litmus paper. And with acids, we checked it with um, blue litmus paper. And what did it do to that blue litmus paper? Yeah, it turned it red. So it turns blue litmus paper red. And then conversely, over here, this turns red litmus blue. So we can also check for acids or bases using those test strips in a lab setting. All right. The other thing that acids often do is when you mix them with a metal, they generate bubbles. Do you remember doing that in lab? There's a previous lab where you dipped in magnesium into hydrochloric acid. What was the gas that was generated? Hydrogen, Hydrogen gas. So often acids will react with active metals to make hydrogen. So that was an example of reacting magnesium and hydrochloric acid, and when you lit the match under it, you probably heard that loud pop noise, right? All right. Conversely, bases don't do that, but they do react with an acid. And we'll go over this more. They react with acids to make water and an ionic salt. I'm going to put salt in quotes. The salt we generally think of as sodium chloride, but a salt can be thought of as any ionic compound, so a combo of a cation and an anion. Over here, acids will do the same thing. They react with bases to make water and salt. And then last but not least, if you ever spill base on your hand, a really quick way of telling if it's a base is whether or not your hand feels slimy. I remember my first job after I got my undergraduate degree was pretty glamorous. I got to wash dishes in a chemistry lab all day long. Um, and the way we wash dishes in a chemistry lab is you actually soak them in a basic solution. And you wear these gloves that go up basically to your elbows or past your elbows and you reach in, grab that glassware that's been soaking and wash it. Well, that room that I was working in got really, really hot. And I remember one day I'm like, what's weird? My gloves feel really slimy today. And I realized I had a hole in one of my fingers and my whole arm was covered in base. That was a pretty nasty rash that I got from there. But I remember my arm feeling really slimy. So that's a good lesson. <laughs> All right. So here's two household groupings. On the left, we've got uh, vitamin C, we've got vinegar, we've got aspirin, we've got oranges and a lemon. It's weird that the lemon's bigger than the orange, but these would all be considered acidic things that you can find at home. On the left-hand side, we've got things like, uh, what is that? That's looks like a laxative. We've got baking soda, we've got ammonia for cleaning, we've got a drain cleaner. All of these would be bases. So some acids and bases are ingestible, meaning they're not going to kill you if you eat them. Obviously some are. Um, so the taste test 
isn't really the preferred method. If we're going to be checking for acids and bases, I would not recommend tasting Drano. Um, that would just be a bad overall idea. All right. Like we said before, you can always check it with litmus paper in lab. That's usually the better route. So the way I always rem remember this is bases turn red paper blue. And it's pretty easy to remember that because B starts with, or sorry, bases start with B and it turns paper uh, blue, so you can compare the two. Where uh, with acids, the opposite is true, right? So you can always check that way. The other cool example uh, in nature is nature actually has indicators like you saw in lab with the um, cabbage. Uh, does anybody know the flower on the right? Hydrangea. Hydrangea. One student taking the botany class. <laughs> Hydrangeas are pretty cool and they're quite colorful. Um, they actually change colors depending on the acidity of the soil that they're growing in. So if you see blue hydrangeas, they tend to be underneath pine trees or near pine trees. The pine needles, when they drop, are somewhat acidic. They change the pH of the soil, and therefore these flowers come out blue. Yeah, you can change it by adding certain um, nutrients to the soil as well. Um, the pink ones are the hydrangeas that tend to grow near um, limestone, so calcium carbonate, which is a base. Therefore, that soil is a lot more basic, and you get the pink flower. All right, so it's kind of cool that nature does have these color indicators, like you saw in lab, too. You can do this at home really easily with uh, red cabbage. Which side is more acidic, the left side or the right side? one on the left, right? So over here we've got acidic. So basically anything that's kind of to the left of the neutral purple color is going to be acidic. Over here we've got neutral, meaning no acids or bases have been added. And then over here all of these would be basic solutions, getting more and more basic. So this is actually a fun thing you can do at home if you've got um, kids around. Um, you can ask them to predict what's more acidic, um, which is more basic, and then actually grind up cabbage and test something like uh, an item underneath your sink. Um, it's a fun thing to do with kids. I do it with my niece and nephew all the time. All right, this is all pretty generic though. We haven't talked about chemistry too much. So let's dive into it in a bit more detail. And there's actually two different ways to describe acids and bases that we're going to cover in this class. The first one is called the Arrhenius definition. And this came out in the early 1900s. And it's a pretty simple definition. It says that acids, when you put them into solution, produce protons. And if you remember, a proton is essentially a hydrogen atom that's lost its electrons, so we can show it as H+. Plus. Where bases are a bit different, they don't produce protons, they produce hydroxide anions. And if you remember your polyatomic ions, hydroxide is an anion. So let's take a look at some common acids in solution and consider what they do. So let's say we have HCl and you put this into solution. HCl is hydrochloric acid, therefore we know it's an acid. This is actually the stuff inside of your stomach that helps you digest food. If it's an acid, we know it must produce protons in solution, right? So we can immediately say this is producing H+, plus. and if it's producing H+, plus, what's going to be left over at the end? 
we've got to account for the chlorine, right? We can't create or destroy atoms. And what charge must that chlorine have? We can't create or destroy charge either. It must be negative to cancel out that positive, right? So when you do these, double check that the right-hand side of your equation has the same net or overall charge as the left-hand side, right? Let's do another one. This is called nitric acid. It's another strong acid. So we know it's going to produce H+. Plus. And what else is going to be left behind? It's got to be that NO3. And just like before, we have to cancel out that negative charge. That's the nitrate anion. It was one of our polyatomic ions that we ran into. All right, let's do the same thing with bases. We could have something like sodium hydroxide. It's often found in drain cleaners. If it's a base, we know it's going to produce the hydroxide anion. So we'd say, all right, hydroxide's definitely going to be produced. And then what's going to be left over? It's got to be sodium with a positive charge, right? So the sodium cation. Let's try a harder one. Do magnesium hydroxide. Why do I have two hydroxides for magnesium? Anybody remember that? So why isn't it just MgOH? Kind of. So if we wrote MgOH, it wouldn't make a lot of sense because magnesium has a positive 2 charge when it's a metal, right? So if magnesium is positive 2 and the hydroxide ion is negative 1, we would need two hydroxide ions, each with a negative 1, to cancel out the positive 2, right? So that goes back to some of our naming. So in this situation, we're still going to produce the hydroxide anion, and we're still going to produce magnesium as our counter cation. But is this reaction bounced? No. In this case, we do need to indicate that there are two hydroxide anions produced in this acid-base reaction. All right, what do you think happens when you mix something like HCl with sodium hydroxide? So let's actually move this down. What happens if you mix sodium hydroxide plus HCl? Whoops. Well, let's try to make sense of this. We said sodium hydroxide is going to be mixed, and it's going to form sodium plus the hydroxide anion. HCl, on the other hand, when we mix it, because it's an acid, it's going to form the chloride anion plus a proton. And if we think about this, right, these two things can react together to form what? If we have a proton and hydroxide in proximity, what do you think could likely form? What does it look like? We've got two hydrogens and an oxygen. Water, yeah. <laughs> so if we mix these together, we can form water. And if we look at what's left over, we'd say, well, sodium and chlor chloride are left over. So we would probably get sodium chloride. This is called a neutralization reaction. So if you mix an acid and a base in equal concentrations like this, you tend to often produce water as one of your products and then an ionic compound as your second product. That's basically the things left over that weren't protons or hydroxide anions. All right, so let's take a look at some common acids that you might see in your day-to-day -day life. The first one is sulfuric acid. Um, that's often found in batteries. So if you ever drive down like 6th Avenue, you'll see a lot of places saying, um, we buy batteries. 
They actually want to get the lead out of those batteries and the sulfuric acid out of those batteries. Sulfuric acid is really, really nasty stuff. You do not want to throw it in your garbage can because if it goes into your garbage, that means it goes into a dump truck. That means the dump truck will smash it at some point and that acid will leak out. It'll get into our groundwater. It'll mess up the environment. So we really want to recycle batteries to prevent sulfuric acid from getting into our uh, environment. All right, hydrochloric acid is used for cleaning metals and bricks. Um, it's also, like I said, the main molecule in your stomach that helps you digest food. So oftentimes it's called gastric acid. Uh, phosphoric acid is a fun one. That's actually found in a lot of colas. So like Coke and Pepsi have a little bit of phosphoric acid in it. If you ever wanna play a fun game with your kids to show them about um, sugar and cavities, um, when they lose a tooth, Take that tooth, put it in a, a little glass of Coke overnight, and then pull the tooth out in the morning. Uh, the phosphoric acid will actually eat away some of that outer layer of the tooth because your tooth is essentially coated in essentially a base. Um, so it's a good way of showing kids that they should brush their teeth and not eat um, too much sugar. Uh, next one's lactic acid that's found in yogurt. Um, does anybody know where else you run into lactic acid? Milk. It's in milk. Think about physical activity, right? If you run a long ways, you get lactic acid build up in your muscles. That's actually that burning sensation. That's what makes running not fun for most people. <laughs> Acetic acid is a little bit different. Acetic acid is found in vinegar. So that's what gives vinegar kind of that um, sour flavor. Um, it's uh, made by basically uh, wine going bad. So if you over oxidize wine, you can make vinegar. Uh, boric acid um, is found in roach poison. Um, it used to be found also in a lot of laundry detergents too, so it would help clean your clothes. And then hydrocyanic acid is a weak acid. Um, it's used in plastics manufacturing, but if you've ever watched like old spy movies where they bite a pill and commit suicide, um, that's oftentimes hydrogen cyanide or potassium cyanide, um, so it's also very, very toxic. All right, common bases. Like I said, sodium hydroxide is found in drain cleaners. It's also used in making soap, so if you ever make soap at home, you'll often use uh, lye. That's the same thing as sodium hydroxide. Uh, potassium hydroxide is also used in making soap. It's also um, really similar to the process used for making biodiesel. Uh, lithium hydroxide is found in lithium ion batteries, so the batteries in your phone and laptop have a lot of that in there. Uh, calcium hydroxide is uh, used to make cement. It's also added to soil sometimes to adjust pH. Uh, magnesium hydroxide is an antacid and laxatives, so sometimes you take that if you've got um, acid reflux. And then ammonia is used in things like Windex, and it's also used worldwide as a fertilizer source. So we've got a lot of acids and bases around us. All right, so what I did want to do was look at the bases in particular. If we look at the bases, one common theme that we saw with the Arrhenius definition was they produce hydroxide, right? So sodium hydroxide makes sense as hydroxide. Same thing with potassium hydroxide. Same thing with lithium hydroxide. Same thing with calcium hydroxide and magnesium hydroxide. But then we get to ammonia. If we look at ammonia, ammonia is classified as a base, but it doesn't even have an oxygen atom in it, so it can't produce hydroxide anions, right? That led to a problem with chemists. They said, all right, the Arrhenius definition is pretty good. It covers the majority of examples, but doesn't cover all examples. And that's where we had to make a new definition. And this is called the Bronsted-Lowry definition. So these two chemists came together to come up with a better definition. All right, and what they said was it's really not about the production of hydroxide, it's more about moving protons around. And so they saw this problem and proposed a solution, and their problem was that not all bases produce hydroxide. 
example we saw in that table was ammonia, which is NH3. And the other problem, whoop, is H plus doesn't really exist in solution. If we think about a proton, right, a proton is a subatomic particle. Subatomic particles just don't float around willy-nilly. They want to react with something and form a stable atom or molecule. All right, so they looked at these two problems and they came up with a new definition. And the new definition says that acids donate protons and bases accept protons. So the way I like to think of this is, has anybody seen a track relay where you hand off a baton, right? The way I like to think of it is the acid is handing off a proton like a baton to the base, right? It's not just letting the uh, uh, baton float around in space, it actually has to be handed off. So the acid is giving that proton to the base, which is accepting it. Um, so it's a, a subtle distinction, but it's important. If you notice though, this doesn't describe hydroxide at all, um, which gets around that problem that we saw with ammonia. So ammonia doesn't produce hydroxide anions. However, ammonia can accept a proton. So it's kind of the receiver of that proton baton. All right, so let's kind of make a note. The proton is handed off between the acid and the base. The proton isn't floating around in solution, it's just simply getting handed off like a baton. All right, so let's take a look at some of these. And I'm gonna show you examples of this handoff. And chemists have a unique way of showing this handoff of protons. So let's start out with this one. We've got ammonia, which is NH3. And we've got hydrochloric acid. We already said ammonia is a base, meaning it accepts protons. And HCl, on the other hand, is an acid. It donates protons. All right, so during this process, the base is basically going to reach out and try to grab that proton like the baton from the acid. And so we show this using arrows in chemistry. These are called electron pushing arrows. So that base is going to reach out and grab that proton. But then that acid has to let go of that proton at some point too, right? So we need to break a bond to show that proton getting handed off. And so we'll show this using an arrow like that. And let me even include all my lone pairs on chlorines. So when this happens, ammonia has taken that proton. The proton has a positive charge which means this nitrogen, once it steals that proton, will also have a positive charge. And then we have chlorine left over. If we look at the covalent bond between the old proton attachment point and the chlorine, that had two electrons. Those two electrons are getting kicked over to chlorine. So now chlorine's pretty happy because it has an octet, and what charge will it have? It would have to be negative, right, to cancel out the positive. So it's important to remember at the end of your acid-base reaction, your base is going to have an extra proton attached to it, and your acid 
will have lost a proton in that process. So that's something I want you to look at with your problem of the day. Let's do another one. Let's do sodium hydroxide. And sodium hydroxide is an ionic compound. We've got a sodium cation. We've got a hydroxide anion floating around like this. And you can actually mix this with water. And if we think about sodium hydroxide, is sodium hydroxide likely going to be an acid or a base? A base. It already has OH minus there. So I would say that this is a base. It accepts protons. That means that conversely, water must be our acid, and it's going to donate a proton. All right, so just like before, our base is going to want to reach over and basically steal or grab a proton from water. So I would say, all right, this base, specifically the hydroxide, is going to grab one of these protons. And then the acid has to let go of that proton. So we're going to break that covalent bond. And when this happens, you're now going to have sodium floating around. And if we look at this whole unit over here that got kicked off, we're going to recreate a hydroxide anion. Oops. So I'll even keep it in the same orientation. So this would be our green unit, right? And then what about this portion right here? What will that become after, or sorry, not green, purple. What will that become after it steals a proton? It'll become water, right? So let me actually circle all of this. And we'll say the other half of this will be the water that was made. And then this proton, I'll highlight it in orange, basically got handed off in that process. So it's a little bit confusing, right? Normally when we think of water, we don't think of water as an acid, right? When you taste water, water doesn't taste sour, at least it shouldn't. <laughs> However, in this case, water is actually donating its proton to the base. And if we look at our final products for this reaction, it looks like we have essentially the same thing being made that we put in. So we're going to talk more about that. This is often referred to as an equilibrium, meaning you've got this happiness, you've got a balance between your starting materials and your products. So they're kind of in an equilibrium state. All right, one last one. This time we're going to have water over here. Oops. And I'm going to have HCl. Is HCl an acid or a base? It's going to be an acid for sure. It's hydrochloric acid by name. So this is going to donate its proton. And then over here we've got our base, which is going to accept a proton. Sorry, I'll slide it up. All right, so our acid is going to give that proton to the base. So the base is essentially going to reach over, grab this proton. The acid has to let go of it, so we're going to break this bond. And now our original water molecule will have three hydrogens coming off of it. It stole that proton, so it's going to have a positive charge. And then chlorine over here must have what charge? Must be negative to counteract that positive, right? So the charge on the left-hand side, the net charge must be the same net charge on the right-hand side. All right, 
This is kind of weird though, and it throws people. So let's compare these last two examples. If we look at the top one, water was acting as an acid, but on the bottom one, water was acting as a base. Water is kind of odd that way. It can act as either an acid or a base, depending on what, is par what its partner is. Um, if it's partnered with a strong acid, then water will act as a base. However, if water is paired with a strong base, then water will act as an acid. It's kind of strange that way. So let's even make a note of that. So water, H2O, can act as an acid or a base. So I think that's where we're going to stop today. I'll give you the last 10 minutes, though, to start working on your pod. That way, if you have any questions, you can ask me while you're here.